Hello everybody. Now, what I would like to do today is have a look at some of the love and relationship poems within the Educas anthology for GCSE English Literature. Now, first of all, I would like to look at Sonnet 43 and Valentine, because I think these are two poems that compare pretty well together. Then I would like to look at Cozy Apologia, She Walks in Beauty, and finally, these two poems that look at the impact of war upon relationships, The Manhunt, and A Wife in London. Now, you could obviously argue that Afternoons by Philip Larkin falls under the relationships category, but in the interest of time, I just want to look at these poems here. So, let's begin with Sonnet 43. Now, if you have a copy of the poems in front of you, that will be much better, because I won't be going through each of these poems line by line. This is, a, this is literally a, a kind of quick summary of some of the key points about each of the poems. Now, this is a very idealistic love poem that's written in the traditional sonnet form. And within the poem, Elizabeth Barrett Browning attempts to define her love for her husband, Robert. And you'll know that this poem begins with the very memorable rhetorical question, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. And this is essentially the structure of the poem. It poses this question at the start, how do I love you? And then she counts the numerous ways in which she loves him. Now, in order to do this, she frequently uses hyperbolic language. Now, at the very start, she claims that she loves Robert with the breadth and height that her soul can reach. So this is really quite over-the-top hyperbolic language. And throughout, there is also frequent use of repetition and anaphora. So, for example... This uh, phrase, I love thee, is repeated on numerous occasions. It almost creates a refrain, a chorus within the poem, to highlight her strength of feeling. She also compares their love to something spiritual, something sacred, something virtuous. She describes it as pure and free, and she uses religious language throughout the poem. She also claims that her love for Robert is similar to the passion that she used to have for her childhood faith. Now, this isn't 100% clear, but this could imply that her love for him has replaced her childhood faith. Now she idolises him. But even at the end, you'll see that it says, If God choose, I shall love thee better after death. So there is this frequent use of religious language. And again, this could imply that her love for her husband has almost replaced the passion that she used to have for her childhood faith. Now, as I've already alluded to, the final line of this poem implies that their love is enduring, that it is eternal and everlasting, so much so that they will love each other after death. Now, just as a contextual point, Barrett Browning actually eloped with Robert against her father's wishes. And this was one of the 44 sonnets dedicated to her husband. So again, highlighting this strength of emotion, this strength of feeling towards him. And we have to ponder here, perhaps the fractured relationship that she had with her family is one of the reasons that she feels she almost needs to prove her intense love for him. I also think that it's one of the reasons why she describes their love as being free, because her, her family were trying to restrict her and push her away from this marriage. But as I said, she eloped against her father's wishes. So this whole theme of intense emotion is something that's really key to this poem. Now, on the flip side, we have Valentine. Now, this is a very subversive poem. It almost rejects all the traditional ideas of love uh, that, and, and the cliched symbols of love that we see today. So, you know that she rejects these tokens of a, of a red rose and a satin heart, and she pushes against these superficial symbols of love. Instead, the speaker of the poem asserts that an onion is a more fitting symbol for complex, modern love, something with many layers. And this onion is used as an extended metaphor throughout the whole of the poem. The speaker, throughout the poem, compares the onion to, to some of the more negative aspects of love. Um, now, if you notice, we've got lots of uh, kind of negative lexical fields. So words like fierce and grief and lethal um, uh, kind of permeate the poem. 
and this simile here, it will blind you with tears like a lover, focuses on some of the more difficult aspects of love, of the pain of lost love. Uh, and this simile also quite clearly compares the onion, that is known for making people cry, with love that she claims make people cry. Even the words like blind, again, or have this sort of negative connotations. The speaker throughout the poem seems to take pride in being honest and open and giving an honest depiction of love that is not glossed over by superficial tokens like a red rose or a satin heart or a cute card or a kissogram. It even says quite emphatically in the poem, I'm trying to be truthful. So the speaker tries to create a very honest and open tone throughout. The restrictive and dangerous nature of love is also implied towards the end of the poem. You'll notice that the, the onion's rings are described as platinum, platinum loops that can shrink to a wedding ring. So comparing the onion to a wedding ring, but the wedding ring's not seen as a symbol of security and love here. It's viewed as a symbol of restriction. Notice that verb shrink is quite a restrictive verb. Love is also described as lethal and having a scent, much like an onion, that will cling to your knife. So some of the more dangerous and restrictive aspects of love are explored towards the end of the poem. And throughout the poem, the speaker makes these comparisons between the extended metaphor of the onion and love. Now, just as another contextual point here, Carol Ann Duffy, her poetry, she's a contemporary poet, a modern poet, and her poetry is known for critiquing materialistic views of society. And she frequently challenges conventional views of love. Um, Duffy is in fact a lesbian and again wants to highlight a, a moving away from the stereotypical traditional ways in which we view love and relationships. Now if we finally compare the form and the structure of the poem, the Sonnet 43 is written in a very traditional classical love poetry form in a in the form of a Petrarchan sonnet. It is written from the first person. Both of these poems are written in the first person, which make them seem a lot more personal and autobiographical. Um, sonnet 43 is written in iambic pentameter, which is uh, said by many to mirror the kind of cadence of natural speech. However, you'll notice, looking at the poem, it's disrupted many times by hyphens and pauses, what we would call caesuri uh, or caesuras. Um, and these are pauses of excitement and breathlessness and passion. Again, highlighting that strength of emotion that she has towards her husband. And as I've mentioned on the, on the previous slide, we have this refrain of I love thee that is peppered all throughout the poem. And it almost makes the poem sound like a prayer. Is she perhaps praying that they will stay together forever? And the final line of loving someone after death obviously highlights that as well. In stark contrast, Valentine is written in free verse. So this means that there is no regular rhyme scheme or meter. And this is said to be done to really reflect the complexity of modern love, the disjointed nature of modern day relationships, that they don't all run in, in synchronicity, that they don't all turn out um, perfect and matched. The lines are also of irregular length and you'll notice that there are several spaces between individual lines. This makes the poem quite disjointed and creates almost awkward pauses throughout and this all creates the effect that we're almost eavesdropping on a conversation between these two lovers and we could say that the, the, the tone in this is again quite honest uh, and quite blunt in many ways. And the poet, the poem's form really is there to reflect the changing expectations of relationships in the modern world. And this free verse uh, form is there to, to highlight how the complexity of modern love and that things don't always fit a, a traditional and classical form. And what we see really between these two poems is a difference between idealism in Sonnet 43, and realism in Valentine.
there we go. Now, moving on to Cozy Apologia. Now, this poem is essentially written as an affectionate tribute to Dove's husband and fellow writer Fred Vibarn, and is written as a defence, an apologia, of her ordinary and contented relationship. So if we look at this first quotation, we're content but fall short of the divine. So this shows that their love is not this idealised spiritual relationship that we see in Sonnet 43, but it is ordinary and plain, but also genuine. Now, the domestic life of this couple as writers is shown through the twin desks, the computers, the hardwood floors. And essentially what happens in this poem is that the arrival of Hurricane Floyd, now this is in green because it's, it's a piece of context, allows Dove to take refuge and gives her what she describes as stolen time to reflect on her contented relationship with her husband Fred. Now, throughout the poem, she compares Fred to everyday objects such as pens, um, but also uses this uh, image of a traditional knight in shining armour. He's described as being astride a dappled mare and dressed in silver stirrups with chainmail glinting to set me free. Now, this succession of quite cliched uh, chivalric images is used for for humour. It's exaggerated. Um, but it also shows how Dove's partner is associated with security, freedom and safety. Now Dove also reflects on her previous relationships, what she describes as teenage crushes on worthless boys. Now this is used to provide a contrast to the fulfilment that she feels in her current relationship um, with those of the past. She also, she describes some of the boys that had crushes on her as thin as licorice and hollow in the centre, signifying that their relationships um, really lacked any substance or meaning. They were very hollow. They had nothing inside. And this, again, is contrasted to the fulfilment and contentment she feels with her husband, Fred. In the third stanza... Dove suggests that she's almost embarrassed by the ordinary and simple nature of their love. She says, when has the ordinary ever been news? And she actually says that she feels embarrassed by the, her sense of happiness. So, unlike Sonnet 43, that's a very idealised and glorified depiction of love, this is about the very genuine, simple and ordinary feeling of love that, that, that Dove... Um, portrays. Now this poem could be described as quite a conversational poem. It uses colloquial language throughout. So for example, she says that Big Floyd is cussing up a storm, which is part of the vernacular of, of the American South. And the first stanza of the poem uses regular rhyming couplets, which perhaps points towards a traditional love poem. But throughout... This rhyme scheme is disrupted in the middle, um, perhaps reflecting how the arrival of the hurricane brings about a, a, a kind of disorder and disrupts this rhyme scheme. Um, but by the end, we get an A-B-A-B -A -B alternating rhyme scheme that is established in the, in, the, in the final four lines. So there are pockets of rhyme within this poem. And the main thing is that this is disrupted with the arrival of the hurricane. So areas where there are pockets of rhyme and, uh, and established rhyme schemes, but also a section where it is very much disjointed and disrupted. Now Lord Byron's poem, She Walks in Beauty. Within this poem, um, Byron basically describes the intense and overwhelming beauty of an anonymous woman. Uh, one that he actually saw in mourning dress at a funeral. Um, throughout the poem, um, Byron uses hyperbole. She cl he claims that she is all the best of dark and bright, suggesting here that she is a perfect balance of beauty. The poem begins 
by saying she walks in beauty like the night, which is a very unconventional opening and, and fits to his uh, status as a romantic poet who defied a lot of the literary conventions of the time. He describes specific aspects of her body. He talks about her raven tress, which means her hair, her eyes and her cheek, um, and then shifts towards her inner beauty and the purity of her mind. Byron describes the mind as the dwelling place of thoughts, and he speaks about how pure this is, as well as her physical attractiveness. So this is a poem about both outward physical beauty and inner beauty as well. She des uh, He describes her as having a nameless grace to her. Um, he says that she has a nameless grace about her. Now, this adjective, nameless, almost suggests that she's too beautiful to be put into words, that her beauty and her purity are indescribable. They are merely nameless. And in the final stanza of this poem, Byron suggests that the woman is pure and perhaps even divine by telling us that her smile tells of days in goodness spent. So this tells us that she's led a very virtuous and moral life, that almost in her face you can see that she's spent days in goodness. And he describes her mind as being at peace with all below almost that she's elevated to a divine, angelic status, looking upon her subjects below. The final line, again highlighting purity, stresses that her love, uh, her heart, sorry, is innocent. Okay, she says that, that, that he says that her heart, whose love, is innocent. Um, suggesting again this idea of purity and virtue. And we should know this, but Byron is a romantic poet, okay, and uh, he often defied expected conventions, and this is shown in the first simile within the poem, the, the first lines within the poem, when he says that she walks in beauty like the night. Notice here that he subverts the common use of light imagery by describing her as being like the night, not bright and radiant and shining, as we might see in works like Romeo and Juliet. He subverts this common expectation and describes her as being like the night, something both beautiful and mysterious. Now, unlike the purity that Byron tries to stress in this poem, um, we could actually say that this very much contrasts with his, with his own personal context. Byron was known for his numerous sexual scandals uh, that included a somewhat um, incestuous affair with his half-sister, and he was described by one of his former lovers as mad, bad and dangerous to know. So although Byron um, asserts the idea of innocence and purity within this poem, he led what we would call a very hedonistic lifestyle, and one that was peppered with numerous sexual scandals. OK, so moving on to The Manhunt and a Wife in London. As I mentioned before, both of these poems explore the impact of war upon relationships. Now, The Manhunt is written from the perspective of a soldier's wife as she attempts to reconnect with her husband after his return home from conflict. The poem describes both the mental and the physical scars endured by the soldier, and it's strongly implied that he's suffering from PTSD. Armitage, the poet, uses a range of metaphors to describe his war-damaged body. So, for example, we have this line about the frozen river which ran through his face, which is clearly a metaphor to describe a scar. Uh, we also hear of the rungs of his broken ribs. And throughout the poem, we see a mixture of military language, but also a language of fragility and delicacy. So, for example, this line about the parachute silk of his punctured lungs. This combines both military language and language of fragility and delicacy, because silk is something that's easily broken. And we also have this quite striking image of the unexploded mine buried deep in his mind. Now, this metaphor strongly implies uh, a kind of PTSD, unexploded trauma that's that's almost ready to burst at any time. And the fact that it's buried deep in his mind highlights that these emotional scars aren't visible 
and that these these emotional injuries, these psychological injuries are much harder to pick at. We see a range of gentle verbs within the poem, so words like trace and attend, which are there to stress how carefully and delicately the wife cares for her husband. This verb bind is also very important. It almost shows the way in which she's trying to rebuild her husband and trying to help him regain his strength. So this is all a poem really that's about the connection or lack thereof between the wife and her husband. The poem shifts from more physical injuries at the start to emotional and mental suffering. The image of the sweating unexploded mind that I, I spoke about highlights the soldier's tense and traumatic memories that he has. And I think the kind of key line for me within this poem is the metaphor of the fetus of metal beneath his chest. Now, this is used to describe the bullet, and it's what we would call quite an incongruous image because it kind of pairs up both life and death. It's, a, it's an unsettling and quite ominous image. And it could imply here that this traumatic event will always live inside the soldier, will always live inside him forever. Uh, like I said, this fetus of metal beneath his chest is a really good metaphor to zoom in on there. Even, even saying that it's quite incongruous, that it's, it's a metaphor that pairs both life and death, is an interesting point of analysis. And I think it could imply, like I've said here, that this event... This traumatic event will always live inside him. The ending of the poem um, does seem somewhat unresolved. The narrator recalls how she only came close to reconnecting with her husband. And it leaves the reader in doubt as to whether she will fully reconnect with him at all. So it's somewhat open-ended towards the end. We see elements of slow progression in terms of a connection between the pair... But ultimately, she only says that she came close. So it is relatively unresolved. So thinking here about uh, the context and form, um, and although the, the, the soldier in the poem remains actually anonymous, the poem is actually based on a true story of an ex-serviceman called Eddie Beddows, who um, was shot in the face in Bosnia. And the bullet actually ricocheted through his face, through uh, all parts of his body, and came to rest. Um, it fractured ribs and things like that, and came to rest in his chest. Um, and upon returning home, he suffered quite heavily from depression and PTSD. So this is a, this is a poem that's based on a real-life person and a real-life event. And what we see in this poem is really, certainly at the start, this poem traces and tracks the journey of the bullet through the soldier's body. But remember, as I mentioned before, this is a poem from the wife's perspective and really is about exploring her slow attempts to, to reconnect with him. Thinking about form now, the poem begins in rhyming couplets, which, uh, in a similar way to Cozy Apologia, points towards a more traditional uh, love poem, but you only need to look at this poem on the page to realise how uh, fragmented and disjointed it is. And the rhyme scheme also breaks down as the poem progresses, which could reflect the kind of brokenness and fragmentation of their relationship, but also of the soldier's mind state. And very visually, you will look at the poem and see that it has a very varying line lengths that also reinforces this idea of of fragmentation and brokenness. Now moving finally on to A Wife in London. Now this poem is in two parts and this is really key to the poem. The, the first half of the poem, the tragedy, it begins with a description of the wife sitting at home in London. She receives a telegram with the news that her husband, who has been in conflict in the Boer War, has been killed. As it says here, fallen in the south in the far south land. Notice the use of euphemistic language here. Not killed, um, not shot, um, not died, but fallen to make it seem that little bit softer. And the far south land is a reference to South Africa. Notice also the use of hyphenation here that shows and further highlights her sense of shock. 
Then the next day, the second half of the poem, the irony is that she re receives a letter from her husband that he wrote before he died. Um, and we hear about all their hopes for the future and their plans to make the most of the summer weather. And this heightens this sense of tragic irony within the poem. The poem makes extensive use of pathetic fallacy. We hear about the tawny vapour of the fog at the start of the poem, which immediately establishes a quite gloomy setting. And we also hear of the street lamp that glimmers cold. Now, this adjective cold has connotations of both death and a lack of emotion. And this is quite an ominous image, and it almost suggests that it almost suggests that hope is already fading before she even hears the news. So the setting is really, really important to this poem. Hardy also uses, quite purposefully, a grammatically incorrect sentence within this poem. When the wife hears the news of her husband, um, when she receives the letter, she says of meaning, it, or should I say Hardy says, of meaning it dazes to understand. Now this doesn't quite make grammatical sense, and this is there to convey the wife's shock at hearing the news that her husband has died. And, as I mentioned earlier, there is quite extensive use of hyphenation, Caesura pauses within this poem to further highlight and reinforce her sense of shock. When she receives the second letter that was written before he died, we hear at the beginning of the second half that the fog hangs thicker. So this use of setting kind of is carried through both sections of this poem, which mirrors the wife's grief. So the setting within this poem mirrors the sense of grief within it. We hear of their plans for ho uh, we hear of their plans for home planned jaunts and trips in the summer weather when he returns. And the final line also makes reference to their new love that they will share. Um, and this creates obviously a very sharp contrast with the husband, the soldier's untimely death and emphasises this tragic sense of irony. So we have to hear about the, their plans that they have together, that they're going to share a new love, that their relationship is going to blossom when he returns. But obviously she receives this letter knowing that, she, that he has already died. And this is where the irony comes in. This is why the second half of the poem is titled Irony. So the two-part structure is really key to this poem. The first title of tragedy almost sets up the expectation of bad news and creates this sense of inevitability, grim inevitability. And notice also how this is just a wife in London. The wife is unnamed. She almost becomes an archetypal, an archetypal figure for the many women who are waiting at home to hear news of their husbands. So this is this wife in this poem is very much a universal and archetypal figure. And just for a bit of context here, this was written at the time of the Boer War, and this was fought in South Africa, as I've mentioned, the far south land, and this is an area that was geographically distanced, uh, distant from London. So this almost adds... Um, this adds to the sense of tragedy while the wife is just merely passive and has to just wait to hear uh, of the, any news. I hope this run through of all the love poems have, has helped you and uh, good luck in your studies. Thank you.